Hello, everybody. Um, I've got kind of a short one for you today. I'm just going to give a brief introduction um, to this film um, and suggest some possible ways of looking at it um, to hopefully inspire an interesting discussion um, in the forum thread. Um, so the film If Bill St Beale Street Could Talk is an adaptation of a 1974 novel by the writer James Baldwin. Um, Baldwin was a Harlem native. Um, he was born at Harlem Hospital in 1924 and is one of Harlem's most influential writers. Um, though he was 10 years younger than Ralph Ellison, um, the two of them actually published their first novels within a year of each other. Um, and of the two, really, probably Baldwin is the more influential. Um, I have um, considered assigning actually this novel in this class in place of Invisible Man, but I like Invisible Man so much that I haven't wanted to let go of it. Um, the difference in their impact is probably really just because Ellison only published three books in his lifetime and is just known mostly for the one masterpiece. Uh, Baldwin, however, published six novels, three plays, and nine collections of essays and short stories between the 1950s and the 1980s. And, you know, some writers are just like that. Some writers write one or two really amazing books. Um, Harper Lee only wrote To Kill a Mockingbird. The second novel was published after her death and without really her consent. Um, and some writers are very, very prolific. Um, so Baldwin had a very long and prolific career um, and was kind of one of the leading literary voices of the civil rights movement. Um, and during his lifetime was often thought of as kind of America's conscience on racial issues because he had this very passionate but nuanced way um, of writing about them. The time span of Baldwin's career also means that the Harlem he portrayed was roughly a generation removed from the one portrayed in Invisible Man. In Invisible Man, we're in the 1930s, 1940s. Um, in If Beale Street Could Talk, we're solidly in the middle of the 1970s. So the action of this film occurs after the major, major civil rights legislation that did away with the Jim Crow regime in the South, but it also occurs after the process of ghettoization that transformed Harlem from a middle-class black enclave to a largely impoverished neighborhood in which residents struggled with housing discrimination, high rents, and the growth of the illicit drug trade. Despite Harlem's artistic and intellectual vibrancy, um, this process of slumification was actually already underway in Harlem in the 1920s, at least a decade before Ellison or even his protagonist even arrived. Um, as historian Jim Garrison says, long before the stock market crash, Black Harlem had become a community in crisis, leading the nation in poverty, crime, overcrowding, unemployment, juvenile delinquency, malnutrition, and infant and maternal mortality. Um, the factors contributing to these conditions were many. Um, overcrowding and deterioration of existing housing um, as new migrants moved from the South um, and new construction in the neighborhood largely claim, came to a stop. Um, you also had both formal and in, informal policies that um, restricted where African Americans could rent or buy property. Um, so there were large sections of New York that were unavailable to them. And so they were sort of crowded into these um, uh, into these neighborhoods where um, demand for housing far out exceeded the um, supply. Um, and uh, then also the Southern migrants who um, came up from the Jim Crow South um, had fairly low levels of education in the South. Of course, schools were segregated by race um, and the black schools were inevitably lower resourced than the white schools. And so the level of education that these migrants brought with them um, was fairly low. Um, and relatedly, there were rather grim um, employment prospects um, for black residents in New York, um, which was still segregated by custom, if not exactly by law. There were certain professions that African-Americans could not easily enter. Um, and places where they could not work. You'll notice in this film that it's a big deal that Tish gets a job um, as a clerk at a department store. Um, all of this combined to bring about a gradual worsening of living standards that would reach their nadir in the period between 1965 and 1990, such that Harlem, which is pictured as a destination, a place of freedom in Invisible Man, um, becomes a, a kind of prison um, in, in the late 20th century. Um, as the title card that opens the film tells us, 
Baldwin intended the name Beale Street, um, which is not in New York City, um, to work as a synecdoche for urban Black America. He says that post Great Migration, the Black experience is really defined um, by these urban neighborhoods where people have to struggle to build a good life for themselves. That part of the story, though, is not really one that I want to focus on in my talk today, though you're welcome to bring it up um, in the forum thread. Um, next week, when we discuss Brother from Another Planet, I'll give a bit more context for Harlem's deterioration in the 1970s and the 1980s. Um, but this week, because we're watching such a beautiful film, like it's a very visually striking film, um, I'd like to spend this time discussing its visual style and suggest it as a way of also talking about its themes. So this film was shot entirely in New York City, um, particularly the neighborhood of Greenwich Village, which is in lower Manhattan. And that's where Fawny lives and where he and Tish later um, have their apartment, their loft apartment. Um, and, and then in Harlem, where he and Tish grew up. And Barry Jenkins and cinematographer James Laxton really celebrate this environment. Um, they celebrate its beauty and they celebrate its history. Um, good examples of, of iconic spaces um, that are given this really romantic treatment um, are like the scene, the gorgeous scene in Greenwich Village with the Puerto Rican flags in the background um, and the neon lights. Um, and the then um, like this scene with this iconic view of um, Lenox Avenue and its red brick row houses. Um, this is an image that you will see again next week in Brother from Another Planet. So it's a really iconic view um, of Harlem. Um, but what's really striking to me is the way that Jenkins and Laxton, who also worked together on the Best Picture winner Moonlight, managed to also find beauty in urban decay. Um, this is not a glamorous side of New York that they are exploring. Um, but somehow even like the grimy graffiti covered subway manages to look somewhat romantic. And part of the way they achieve this is through this ultra saturated color palette which highlights everything in these really bright, rich yellows, blues, and greens. Um, Laxton has said that these color choices were not intended to necessarily be symbolic. Um, we can't find a kind of one-to-one -one correlation between a color and a concept. You know, as you probably know from reading Crime and Punishment, you know, yellow is often means decay, you know, um, uh, red often means passion, that kind of thing. That's, that's not really what's going on here. Rather, um, Laxton wanted the colors to evoke a feeling. Um, he said um, in an article or in, in an interview for a magazine that thinking about love and thinking about young love especially, um, what comes to my mind is warmth. Memories of past loves, I think of reds and yellows um, and oranges. And so you'll notice that in all of the costuming, um, th th he picks up on these colors, um, these, these beautiful, beautiful colors, which are all, again, um, really saturated in order to in order to bring them out and to, to make them really, really noticeable. Um, I think that these colors also sort of evoke nature, um, blue sky, sunlight, green plants. They contribute to a sense of vibrancy and life in a landscape that could have easily been reduced to grays and browns. And in fact, when New York City is um, filmed for a period film set in the 1970s, it's often shot in that color scheme. Think Scorsese's Taxi Driver. Um, instead, by contrast, um, the neutral colors serve to set off the more organic tones. And we can see this not only in the costuming, but in the ways the interiors and the props um, pick up on these colors and these organic motifs. So notice the wallpaper behind Tish in the shot on the bottom left. Um, notice the flower pot and the flowers in the scene where um, Fawny brings Daniel home um, and notice like the green glass um, connected to one of uh, Fawny's sculptures um, in this image of, of his apartment. And then of course, Tish is wearing this yellow dress. Um, so uh, pick just about any shot from this film and you're gonna notice the ways in which these visual elements are integrated into just about every scene, um, whether through costume or through a prop or even um, sometimes these colors are found just um, in, in the actual environment. Um, so in the discussion thread, I'd like us to do what we did with Gangs of New York and have you all talk about your favorite scenes or your favorite shots, favorite visuals, etc. Um, but as an example of how Jenkins and Laxton fill these decayed urban spaces with life, um, I want to give just a brief analysis of one particular scene. And that is the scene in which Tish and Fawny tour the Greenwich Village loft that ultimately becomes their home.
Um, and as I do this, I'm going to kind of mix the modes of historical analysis and the close reading um, approaches so that you can kind of see how that works. So I think part of what makes this such a New York story is the fact that there is so much drama wrung out of the simple act of finding an apartment. It's kind of like the job hunting scenes in Sister Carrie. It's something that is so mundane, but so crucial to the characters and so crucial to the story. Um, for this scene, I want to kind of put forward the thesis that the scene shows how um, the dingy and rather dilapidated urban spaces in this film are transformed into spaces of endless possibility. Um, they suggest not decay, but the promise of new growth. Um, and in fact, the 1970s in New York were the heyday of the artist's loft. Um, these former industrial spaces that had been abandoned as manufacturing declined within the city and moved outside of it. Um, and these spaces were being, uh, these buildings were being bought up and rented to young creative people for very little money. Um, what differentiates a loft from an apartment is that a loft basically takes, usually occupies the entire floor of a building, as we see um, Tish and Fawnies does, um, which means that while they tended to lack like the features of what we would typically think of as a living space, like rooms and kitchen appliances and indoor plumbing, um, they did offer a lot of space, which was really attractive for artists who were living for a place to work as well as to live. And very often you would have many, many young people occupying these lofts in these sort of artist collectives and living in this kind of communal way. And it's even in Fani's speech to Tish, he even kind of suggests that w this is what he envisions. So Andy Warhol famously had a loft in Soho, not far from where Tish and Fani are living. This is Andy Warhol's loft. Um, so did David Bowie. I couldn't find a picture of that one. David Bowie's former loft in um, Soho, I think recently sold for some ridiculous sum of money, like $7 million or something like that. Um, an artist loft is the setting for the 1994 musical Rent, in which an artist collective is living all together in a very rundown building in Greenwich Village. Um, it's also one of the settings for Martin Scorsese's film After Hours, in which this young man comes down to Soho for a date and winds up having all these bizarre adventures among kind of the artists and bohemians of this area of New York. So in short, the kind of space that Tish and Fani are living in is a really iconic piece of New York history real estate and of art life. And it doesn't really exist anymore, at least not in a way that is available to regular people. Because Manhattan has gentrified so much, um, because the real estate has become so expensive and so many very wealthy people see it as a desirable place to live, um, their loft would easily cost $10,000 a month these days. Um, and in fact, that that's probably a figure that's too low. Um, so, but this, this was the 1970s, the 1960s, 1970s were a moment where a young creative person could go and find a place to live and create um, in New York City. Um, not a very glamorous time in New York history, like I said, but um, one in which it was possible to be a young artist and to live and work um, in Manhattan. So um, drawing upon that history, this film is showing us this world of 1970s New York in which a rundown urban space like this could become a place of genuine creativity and possibility. So here are Tish and Fani in their signature yellow and sky blue clothing. And as the camera, so Fani gives this speech in which he talks about the possibility that he sees in this space. And the camera rotates all the way around. It does a complete circle. It's hard to capture motion in still photography, um, but, um, but you get the sense if you go back and watch the scene. And you will see that the camera picks up all of those colors. I mean, it finds all of those colors in the space as it rotates around. We see the yellow of the sunlight streaming in from the windows. There's even a blue pane of glass um, in the windows. Um, and we see this green paint on um, the brick pillars, um, the, the, the brick support beams um, of the building. So um, that kind of, that, that color serves to kind of tie Tish and Fawny to the story because um, the colors have become at this point so associated with the people. It links to, to the space and it also imbues the space with a sense of warmth and possibility as Fani is talking about it. And as we see, this becomes not only the place where Fani will create his art, but it becomes the place in which they will create their family. And Baldwin in his novel really linked these two ideas that the creation of a beautiful life is a work of art, um, just as Fani's sculpture. Um, is a work of art, and that Tish and Fani in their love are involved in this, you know, beautiful act of, of creation, 
um, and it's not just kind of what we typically think of as art. So this is actually all I'm going to say for right now. Um, for our discussion, I'm going to give, again, the same directive as I did for Gangs of New York. Please share with us your favorite scene or even a still shot and explain what you think it contributes to the film. Um, if you want further insight into the creative process that went into this movie, um, I've put up some links on Canvas for you to explore. You can see some of the work of um, the photographers who photographed Harlem that um, Laxton and Jenkins drew upon um, in creating the digital style for or in creating the visual style for this film. Um, so thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing what you have to say about it.